These tutorial videos will focus on the macromolecules known as proteins. This particular video will focus on amino acid structure. When I first think of protein, fish, eggs, cheese, and even protein shakes come to mind. So what is so important about protein? Well, proteins account for most everything an organism does and is about 50% dry mass of a cell. When we talk about dietary protein, we are referring to the amino acids that make up protein structure. These amino acids are essential to almost everything the body does. There are tens of thousands of proteins with complex structures. These are built from just 20 amino acids, many of which we receive through diet. Proteins have several roles. They act for storage purposes, act as structural support, aid in movement, transport other molecules, are needed for cellular defense, act as receptors during cellular communication, and are even hormones and enzymes. Enzymatic proteins act as catalysts, speeding up the processes of metabolic reactions. Catalysts are not consumed by a reaction, so they are able to function over and over again. Proteins have many functions. They are necessary for DNA replication and are an essential part of the cell cycle. All proteins are made from the same 20 amino acids. A polymer of amino acids is called a polypeptide. Polypeptides are linear, unbranched chains of amino acid polymers. Proteins are functional, polypeptides are not. Polypeptides could be thought of as the yarn that makes up a sweater. The sweater itself, however, is functional and analogous to protein. A protein consists of one or more polypeptide and has been twisted, shaped, bent, folded, and coiled. Some proteins are globular or spherical in shape, while others are long or fibrous. Protein shape has wide variety and determines protein function. However, protein function is not only determined by shape, but also by its ability to bind and recognize other molecules. The molecules that proteins bind to are called ligands. Proteins have their amino acid side chains structured for spatial and chemical recognition of ligands. The protein location that binds to ligands is called the binding site. There may be multiple binding sites on a protein. I have created a protein, and this protein has two binding sites. This protein binds the blue ligand, but it will not bind the orange ligand. Since there is more than one binding spot, this protein can bind both of these blue ligands. As you can see, the ability to bind a ligand can determine protein function. Amino acid monomers form polymer structures and are the building block of proteins. Amino acids all have similar features. 19 of the 20 amino acids have a central carbon that is asymmetric called the alpha carbon. Remember, asymmetric carbons have four different groups of atoms coming off of it. Amino acids will all have three of these groups the same, an amino group, carboxyl group, and a hydrogen molecule. The last group coming off the asymmetric carbon is the variable side chain. Here is a list of the 20 amino acids with the red dots representing the asymmetric carbon. Every amino acid has an asymmetric carbon except for glycine. Glycine is the most simple amino acid and does not have a variable side chain. The side chain group of every other amino acid is different from one another. It is the side chain that determines the chemical properties of each amino acid. The different side chains of amino acids allow for four unique amino acid classifications. The blue box represents the consistent feature of each amino acid, so the carboxyl group, amino group, and hydrogen atom. The four categories of amino acid side chains will each be represented by a different color. The four categories are Nonpolar amino acids, polar amino acids, acidic amino acids, and basic amino acids. Nonpolar amino acids are called so because they have nonpolar side chains made of alkyl groups. If you remember, alkyl groups are made of carbons and hydrogens. Nine of the 20 amino acids are nonpolar. These amino acids are insoluble in solution and are hydrophobic or have a fear of water. Polar amino acids have side chains that are full of hydroxyl groups, sulfur groups, carboxyl groups, and amino groups. There are six polar amino acids 
and these are soluble and hydrophilic or water loving. The two acidic amino acids have side chains that are negatively charged when placed in solution. These amino acids have carboxylic acids in their side chains and are named aspartic acid and glutamic acid accordingly. These acidic amino acids are hydrophilic. There are three amino acids with basic side chains. These chains have amino groups that become positively charged when placed in solution. Basic side chains are hydrophilic as well. Take note that since all amino acids have both carboxyl and amino groups, the terms acidic and basic refer only to the side chain. We will now have a review of polypeptides, amino acids, and their structures. Remember, there's a five second countdown at the bottom right hand of the screen. If you need time to answer the question, go ahead and pause the video. True or false, polypeptides are folded functional chains of amino acids. This is false, polypeptides are linear and non-functional. Proteins bind molecules called what? Proteins bind ligand molecules. Each amino acid has what four groups coming off its asymmetric carbon? These groups are the amino group, carboxyl group, hydrogen atom, and a variable side chain. Remember, glycine does not have the variable side chain. What are the four unique amino acid classifications? The four unique classifications are nonpolar, polar, acidic, and basic. True or false? Nonpolar side chains are hydrophilic. This is false. Nonpolar side chains are the one classification of amino acids that are hydrophobic. True or false? Basic amino acids have a positive charge in solution. This is true, and it's due to the positive charge of the amino group on the variable side chain. This protein tutorial will cover polypeptide formation as well as protein structure. Remember how I said polypeptides can fold, bend, and coil to form proteins? Well, there are four levels of protein structure that need to be learned. The names of these levels are quite simple. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Every protein has the first three levels or structures. Quaternary structure only applies to proteins with more than one polypeptide chain. Primary structure describes the amino acid sequence of the protein. Amino acids are linked in unique, linear arrangements. The structure and order of amino acids is not determined through random linking. Amino acid order is instead determined by genetic information which has been inherited by that protein. As we learned earlier in the semester, if left to chance, mathematically there would be a large amount of amino acid sequences possible. Each amino acid position is filled by one of the 20 amino acids used as building blocks. The sequence of these amino acids and the chemical nature of the backbone and side chains determine what the secondary and tertiary structures of protein will be like. In other words, amino acid sequence determines the folding pattern of the protein. But how do these amino acids combine to form these polypeptide structures that are also the primary structure of protein? Here we have three different amino acids, asparagine, tyrosine, and methionine. Asparagine and tyrosine are both polar amino acids. Methionine is nonpolar. Here we see them side by side. The blue box again represents the amino group, carboxyl group, and hydrogen atom of each amino acid. Amino groups and carboxyl groups both form peptide bonds. This means that the carboxyl group of one amino acid, or in this case asparagine, can form a peptide bond with the amino group of tyrosine. As you can see, each carboxyl group has a hydroxyl group, and each amino group has a hydrogen atom. During peptide bond formation, a dehydration reaction occurs. 
and a water molecule is formed as a hydrogen is lost and a hydroxyl group is lost. This forms a bond between the two amino acid backbone components. These bonds occur one at a time as a polypeptide chain is formed. The linkage of these amino acids forms a primary structure of protein. This creates a nitrogen and carbon backbone with the side chains as extensions. Polypeptides can be either a few or thousands of amino acids long. Specific polypeptides have particular linear arrangements of amino acids. These linear backbone chains of amino acids have two ends, one with a free amino group and the other with a free carboxyl group. The amino end is the head of the chain and is known as the N-terminus. The carboxyl end is the tail of the chain and is known as the C-terminus. An amino acid which has been incorporated into a polypeptide chain is referred to as a residue. These residues are numbered sequentially beginning with the N-terminus of the chain. This particular residue would be 117 amino acids long. Secondary structure is the spontaneous folding and coiling of primary structure. It is the result of hydrogen bonding between segments of the polypeptide backbone. Remember, the carboxylic oxygen on the backbone has a partial negative charge and hydrogen on the amino group has a partial positive charge. Hydrogen bonds form between these atoms. These individual hydrogen bonds are quite weak, but when repeated over and over, they are collectively strong. The two most common types of secondary folding are alpha helices and beta sheets. Alpha helices are coils formed by hydrogen on every fourth amino acid. Beta sheets have at least two parallel polypeptide backbones held together by these hydrogen bonds. Beta sheets are pleated. So here you can see alpha helices and they have a coiled look to them. The beta sheets are more pleated and you can see the two parallel structures being bonded together. As I've already stated, the hydrogen bonds of alpha helices and beta sheets do not take place between amino acid side chains. The bonding is between the backbone components. Secondary structure is the interaction between backbone pieces. Tertiary structure is the interaction of amino acid side chains. The interactions of the side chains are in the form of hydrophobic interactions, hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, and disulfide bridges. Hydrogen bonds of tertiary structure occur between polar side chains. Ionic bonding occurs between positive and negative side chains, or basic and acidic side chains. Hydrophobic interaction is the interaction of nonpolar side chains as they cluster close together. The hydrophobic molecules are most often held together by van der Waals interactions. Disulfide bridges form between two cysteine monomers. The disulfide bridge is a covalent bond that occurs between the sulfhydryl groups and the side chains. It is the folding and bending of the backbone associated with these bonds and tertiary structure that stabilizes the three-dimensional shape of a protein. Proteins fold in the manner that costs the least amount of energy. Proteins are stabilized by the free energy released by hydrophobic collapse or by the formation of weak bonds. During hydrophobic collapse, a hydrophobic core forms in the protein interior, made of nonpolar amino acids. While well, you can see the secondary structures of the alpha helices and beta sheets, it is the tertiary structures that allows the shape of the protein to take place. So the interactions of the side chains are what lead to this shape of the molecule. Most of the time, there are two or more polypeptides that combine to form a larger molecule. The formation of these molecules results in a protein structure that is an aggregate of polypeptide units. In other words, it is when two or more folded proteins associate into a functional protein and is known as the quaternary structure. 95% of proteins have quaternary structure. The same bonding in tertiary structure is the bonding of quaternary structure. So as you can see, there are two separate tertiary structures. Two examples of quaternary structure are collagen and hemoglobin. Collagen has three helix polypeptides that intertwine. These three helix polypeptides intertwine forming a superhelix. Hemoglobin is made of four polypeptide subunits. So you can see the four different subunits. Chaperone proteins or chaperonins assist in the folding of other proteins. These proteins are crucial in that they provide a shelter for proteins as they fold. 
to ensure proper folding into a natural state. So as you can see, we have a polypeptide and as it enters the chaperonin, an environment is formed where it can fold into its natural state. Without this shelter, polypeptides can be misfolded when important weak bonds are disrupted. Sometimes tertiary structures form partial quaternary structures and protein subunits are formed. However, these subunits are not functional proteins because additional protein subunits are lacked. It is very important that proteins fold properly. Often, proteins do not form properly due to mutations on a genetic level. When amino acid mutations occur, the protein may have improper folding and function. For example, sickle cell anemia is an inherited blood disorder. It occurs when there is a substitution of one amino acid for another in a hemoglobin molecule, which we just learned about. A hemoglobin molecule is a quaternary structure. However, on the primary structure level, a substitution of one amino acid for another results in the sickle cell anemia. In this case, a valine is substituted for a glutamic acid at position 6. This primary structure mutation has destructive effects on the ability of hemoglobin to function. The structure with the largest influence on protein folding is primary. If primary structure is affected, then consequently secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures will also be affected. A protein is said to be denatured when the environment causes the protein to lose its natural shape and function. Denaturation is caused in many ways and results in an unfolded protein. For example, if a protein has normal structure in aqueous solution, structure may be negatively affected when placed in a nonpolar solvent. Factors such as temperature, salt concentration, and pH affect structure. Other denaturants include excessive heat, detergents, strong acids, strong bases, and organic solvents. Proteins are denatured by the disruption of weak bonds that hold together secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. Sometimes a denaturant is removed and a protein can retain its original conformation. This process is called renaturation. However, proteins often cannot return to original shape because denaturation has already caused the unfolded protein to form new structures. Again, here are some more review questions. These ones will be over protein structures. Remember, there's a five second countdown and pause the video if you need more time to answer the question. Peptide bonds formed by which reaction? Peptide bonds formed by a dehydration reaction, and remember a water molecule is formed in the process. True or false, amino acid residues are numbered sequentially beginning with the C terminus. This is false. Amino acid residues are numbered sequentially beginning with the N terminus or amino terminus. Secondary structure is the result of what type of bonding? Secondary structure is the result of hydrogen bonding between backbone components. The ionic bonding that is a part of tertiary structure occurs between what structures? The ionic bonding occurs between acidic and basic side chains of the amino acids. True or false, all proteins have quaternary structure. This is false. Only about 95% of proteins have quaternary structure. Which of the following does not act as a denaturant? The answer is inorganic solvents, however, organic solvents do act as denaturants.